So any New Year's resolutions, Seymour? Is it a special occasion for you when the uh, Earth revolves around the sun? Well, first of all, Ben, you don't suppose that one day a year, namely a New Year's Day, that we're going to make resolutions that are going to hold us instead for an entire year? Sheer nonsense. That is nonsense. But yes, I will make a general resolution. And I want to address different categories of pianists. But there is a surprise at the end. I'm saving that for the end. Well, the first category is going to be the beginning pianists. Then I have some messages to give to teenage students who are going to audition for contests and so forth and make some suggestions to them. And then I'm going to address the advanced pianist in general. They can't play by ear. I'm not sure that they should even memorize music if they can't play by ear. Then. The last category will be the virtuoso pianist who enters major competitions, hundreds of thousands of students of all ages and of all abilities around the world. This is whom I'm addressing. And not only the students, but their teachers. And not only their teachers, but their parents. The parents need to get some advice because they very easily can ruin everything. So the parents around the world who are listening to this, they have to trust me and they have to obey what I'm going to tell them. Don't you think for one moment that your child is going to be able to have a piano lesson and sit alone for one hour and activate everything that the teacher explained to him at the lesson. It ain't going to happen. You start your child in piano lessons, you have to be prepared to sit one hour every day with your child and supervise the practicing. And you have to appear at the lesson with the child with a tape machine and record the lesson so that you prepare the child properly for the next lesson. Now, mind you, we're teaching your child to read and write. And the child goes every day to school to learn to do that. Now you're going to expose him to one of the most difficult things in the world, and that is interpreting music on a keyboard. And he gets one lesson a week. He's not going to make progress unless you supervise the practicing. I'm so sick and tired of hearing par parents tell me, Oh, I, I, I work too hard. I don't have time to sit. Any parent who can't devote one hour a day to his child has to do a great deal of thinking. Now, this is what you're going to hear 75% of the time. I hate to practice. I want to use, I want to play with my video games. Darling, if you really don't love music enough, it's all right. I don't have to teach you music. Is that what you're going to tell the pupil? All right. His name, his name is, her name is Lucy. She wakes up on a Thursday morning. She's five years old. Mommy, I don't feel like going to school. Oh, honey, if you don't like to go to school, it's all right. Just stay in bed, sweetheart. I'll bring you your juice. Would you ever say that to your child? No. 
your child will never learn to read or write or to have the brain activated to learn other subjects. So if you don't believe that the study of music is necessary for your total development and the total development of your child, then let's just not talk about this at all. But if you do believe that, you take this very seriously. Mommy, I hate it, I hate it. If I don't want to practice anymore. All right, Lucy, let me tell you this much. If you don't sit with me one hour every day, there will be no TV for you. There will be no going out to your friends. Take your pick. How about that? Listen, I've been all through this with parents. What I just said is a magic formula. And now this is what is bound to happen, but not always. What is bound to happen is the child is being forced to go through certain routines on the keyboard properly and in the process become so infatuated with it that he wants to do it all by himself. The music itself gets to his very soul. The ability to do something that he was never able to do before is filling him with all kinds of courage and a good feeling about himself. And this is almost always what happens with my experience. So much for children. Now we're going to go to intermediate students. Many of you are impassioned about certain pieces in the repertoire. Pianists have more pieces written for them than any other instrument. Think of what Beethoven left us. Think of what Schubert left us in Rachmaninoff. It's overwhelming. And very often, you want to play pieces that were way beyond you. And if you continue to do this, you're not going to develop properly because you're always battling against the passage that you really can't play as yet. So this is what I advise you to do. Your teacher may not suggest this, but I want you to suggest it. You should be studying all the time three kinds of pieces. One piece that is within your power to play. Another piece that you can sight read very easily and bring to fruition without too much trouble. And a third piece that is a little beyond you. And they all work together, you see? And at the same time, you have to be practicing technical exercises so that you get your physicality is a major thing in order to express the deepest feeling of music. You can't do it unless all the parts of your mechanism are functioning properly. So you have to divide your practicing very intelligently. So if I were you, I would devote, if you only have one and a half hours to practice, I would devote 20 minutes to technical exercises. And I have, by the way, I have warm up exercises in my book with your own two hands. So I don't want to even demonstrate them because they're all written out. And I hate to sound commercial by even mentioning my book, but it's just a convenient thing for you to have. Well, can I be and commercial too? Because you also, yeah. you demonstrated some of these warm-ups in your tone-based course, uh, keyboard did, choreography. Yes. So. Uh, oh, oh, they're there. 
maybe the child, maybe the teenager, maybe the adult amateur should uh, maybe sign up it, for Tone Base? You can just turn on your internet and get these exercises. All right. So that will, that's part of your practicing. So now I have some advice for teenage students. Your teacher is going to enter you in auditions. They're gruesome. All contests and all auditions are gruesome. But you know what? The best thing about it is that it makes you so nervous that you've never practiced better in your life than when you have to play at a contest or you go to an audition. You go out on the stage and the judges are sitting there like in the Roman, uh, 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 what do you call it? Where the lions came, the Roman what? The arena. The arena, the Roman arena now. They're ready to, to launch, to, to set the lions at you. This is what it appears to you when you walk across the stage. They're dangerous, those people out there. <laughs> I don't even, I, I think they don't even like me. All right. And the chances are they, they have all of your repertoire that you're going to play. And the chances are they'll say, Lucy, you may start with whatever you like. This is what usually happens. They're considerate and they know that you, you don't know anything about that instrument that you're about to play. And you are to say, may I just play something to warm up, to find, to get used to the piano? The judges will be so impressed with you. Because listen, I've been a judge so many times. I can tell you, no judge will ever say no. They'll, they'll congratulate you. Wonderful that you want to do this. We understand. They're, they've been all through this, you see. So this is what you do. I'm warning you now that if you play a perfect scale at 144 on the metronome, from the beginning to the end, forte, and you never miss a note, you're going to make the worst impression. The judge is going to say, oh, this is an unmusical person. He's just mechanistic. But if you play a scale and you start like this, and you get louder and louder and louder, you impregnate it with feeling and then diminuendo on the way down. And then you play a series of chords. two chords you're going to try to the soft pedal to see if the soft pedal works now all of that took 30 seconds the judges are very impressed with you they're already on your side is that clear all students now in the intermediate grade for every audition that you're going to have now here's something very important. Are you listening now carefully? Not only teenagers, advanced pianists especially also. I hope you're listening. Music enters our ear. And guess what? The majority of pianists who are listening to me right now can't play by ear. I'm not speaking about perfect pitch. If you have perfect pitch, this doesn't apply to you. If you have a good relative pitch, it's possible that you can survive and play from memory. But if you don't have good relative pitch, 
and you're already playing advanced repertoire, this is what you have to do. Now trust me and do it and don't ask any questions because I have put this to the test and to my great satisfaction, it works with everyone. Your teacher has just given you Furalisa. You can play it perfectly at two o'clock in the morning from memory. Now I want you to take the index finger of your left hand and play me Furalisa. What? You heard me. Just play the tune of Furalis. Oh, 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 okay. That is bound to happen. Now, when that happens, that means that you have no intervallic relationship in your ear. How about this statement? Is today Thursday? Huh? Yes. All right. If you start this of your favorite pieces, you're going to spend 15 minutes doing this, by the way, every day. If you start this tomorrow, in six months, you'll develop your relative pitch. And you'll actually be able to play pieces by with your ear. How about that? So what they should start is trying to play melodies of their pieces with the, the left, left hand, left hand and index finger. See, you're breaking up the reflex, the automatic pilot. And you're just, you have nothing to help you except your ear. And it's a hunt and peck system. See, until you get the right pitch. So this is a very important thing to do. Now we're going to the virtuoso pianist, there has never been a level of piano playing as there is today. Do you agree, Ben? Uh, I have to agree because I know a lot of them and there's got to be more amazing virtuoso pianists today than ever before. Nobody seems to know why. Do you know why? I think it might be because there's more people on the earth. Oh, really? You think that's why? Really? I, that's, that's just my hunch. That's my hunch. Yeah. So now the major ones are the ones who enter the big competitions, right? Like the Van Clyburn, the Rubinstein competition, the Queen Elizabeth of Belgium. Is that still on also? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay. And now what happens? They get to the finals. In all cases that I have read, there are six finalists. And guess what happens? The best pianists in the world practically are sitting there, all six of them, all potential winners. The judges are just, they're beside themselves. They don't even know which one to choose. They're so good. They choose one winner. Now, I hope my message is going around the world to every crevice so that every piano teacher is going to hear what I'm about to say. I have written year after year, letter after letter, telling them to stop this archaic practice. 
there has to be six winners, not one winner. Oh, there isn't enough money to go around. Isn't that too bad? Oh, there aren't enough concerts to go around. How terrible. Those six pianists are going to be the winners. They'll fend for themselves if they are, if necessary. They don't need your filthy money. You just make them the winner and stop this nonsense. And now it's even worse for the winner himself. Guess why? Because a lot of attention is given to him. The best kinds of concerts major orchestral performances and on series going for about two years and now the third year comes he's replaced by the next winner and all of his concerts vanish it is so inhuman this has got to stop now listen in our country there is the National Federation of Music Clubs. Do you know what that is? That means that every state in the country has a music club attached to the national one. Every teacher in the United States has to band together and write a letter that is going to declare this practice archaic and they're not going to tolerate it one more year. It has got to stop. The heads of these juries have got to stop this nonsense. They're causing harm to the most gifted people in the world. What do you think of this? It sounds like you're calling for the end of competitions as we know it. I am not. I mean, what makes you say that? Well, it might not be a bad thing. Well, at least you're challenging the structure of how winners are selected and how we promote their uh, careers. On the contrary, I, I, I'm in, I encourage competitions because you've entered them, haven't you? Yes, but not haven't so successfully. <laughs> Haven't you practiced your head off harder than of you've course. ever done? Of course. Haven't I? Haven't I? Of yes. course. So in that sense, they're wonderful. They elevate your playing. What's wrong with being one of six winners? What's wrong with that? So are you calling for a kind of tie for first place? Because that, that sort of happened at the last... Tchaikovsky competition, or at least there were many ties. There were multiple second prizes and multiple I'm third prizes. I'm talking six ties. <laughs> I'm not talking about two ties. However, whatever number of students make the finals, in some competitions, there are three. In the Gina Bach Hour, which I auditioned several times, there were three finalists at the end. In my, what I'm suggesting is that's the end of the competition. Those three students are the winners. Are you going to, to support it? It's I will, place? I will write letters of protest. I will pick it, uh, the next competition that dares to choose a, a single gold medalist. Um, let's have a universal petition throughout the United States. Every teacher. In the, in the music, the music organization, every teacher is going to lend their signature to it. We have to contact the president of the National Association of Music Clubs. So I'm wondering, do you have any advice for those virtuoso pianists besides to become activists uh, for this cause? Um, because a lot of them are sweating it out, practicing eight or 10 hours a day injuring themselves, probably wondering what it's all meant to be. Why, you know, what is this all for? What is the purpose of all of this? So maybe some, yeah, do you have any spiritual guidance for this kind of uh, 
lost virtuoso who perhaps only makes it to the competition and doesn't advance or even the ones who make the finals and become so jaded from from the labor that it took to to you know put put into the effort to put into this competition and for what i'm going to take it philosophically and i'm aware that this is new years and i'm aware that I'm a person that has a certain degree of experience. I'm certainly old enough to have had experience, aren't I? In April, I'm going to be 96, you know. So suppose, Ben, that I begin to answer your question by asking you a question. If I gave you a real reason why you're going to benefit from practicing. Would you rethink it? I believe so. Do you know why you're practicing? I feel some kind of compulsion to practice. I can't really put my finger on it. No pun intended. First of all, are we all in music? I hope because we love music. Let's just assume so. No one is putting a gun to our heads, at least. And we're certainly not making any money doing it. Well, that's for sure. All right. So now let's discuss what is in, what's entailed in practicing and why we should do it. You know, in Plato's time, they, have it, they had in their educational system something that they called a quadrivium. You know, quad means four, right? So the word quadrivium pertains to four subjects without which the ancient Greeks thought we could never develop properly. Would you like to guess what one of the subjects was? I believe it was, was music. It was music. <laughs> oh, what do I win? Do you know how important that is? Look here. There are 20,000 pages of educational requirements going to all the schools. The word music never appears once. That's what we're, the, the civilization in which we're living now. So now we're going back to learn from the ancient Greeks. Why have they chosen music? I'm going to explain to you why. They knew that the study and performance of music entails everything about you with the uts which other subjects don't entail. It entails your intellectual world, your emotional world, and you want to give me the third? Your physical world. Oh, you're perfect. <laughs> ben, you know, did you? Did you know that in advance that I was going to ask that question? Well, I've seen a Seymour Bernstein video or two in my oh, time. So, so so you know about this. I know a little bit about it, but, you know, the fact well, that we inhabit a physical world is probably the bane of every pianist's existence. If only we didn't have to use our crummy bodies to make such beautiful music. You know what I mean? Well, you might as well say that to a dancer. If only I didn't have to know how to hold my hand and my knee at the same time, I wouldn't, I would have much less difficulties to dance. Don't be so silly. Every gesture that a dancer makes and practices is to express the feeling of the music that they're dancing to. So I use the same terminology. I use the word chore choreography. We have to make choreographic attitudes in order to translate our feelings into the piano. So now you want to have 
music is a language of feeling. Now you want to express your feeling on an inanimate object. It ain't going to do it unless you make certain physical attitudes, exactly as dancers do. Serious practicing and the experience of performing leads towards the integration of the personality. You're integrating thinking, feeling, and physical coordination. In, this is going to shock you what I'm about to say. No psychiatrist agrees that that can happen. Every psychiatrist that I interviewed in writing my book with your own two hands said, you can never think and feel at the same time. It's not possible. But you not only do that and you're playing the piano, but you're also coordinating your body, all three at the same time. How about that? So you see, it has to affect your life. I know for certain my pupils, almost all of them have told me, Seymour, I can't tell you, studying with you, I, I, it has affected my life. They've told me that. So it's very important. Now, this is what I wanted to save for the end. Practicing the piano is not creative at all. It's recreative. I didn't write that Beethoven sonata, but what I'm trying to do is to recreate it so that I can become one with one of the greatest minds that ever walked the face of this earth. What a privilege for me but I didn't write that sonata. So up until the time of Rachmaninoff, he was the last great virtuoso composer. After that period, the composer and the performer parted company, entered Juilliard and all the conservatories you audition as an instrumentalist or you audition as a so-called theory major, which means composition, actually. Do you do both? Of course not. Enter Evgeny Kissin into this picture. Seymour was invited by the Sony Corporation in their box in Carnegie, Carnegie Hall to hear him give an old Chopin program. Oh, I, I almost fell out of the box. I can't tell you. I can't, I was just so amazed that I, it was impossible. I went back to see him. He was standing against a white wall. Mr. Kissin, there's no way that I can tell you what your playing means to me and to the world. You were one of the greatest that ever lived. But there's something that you have to do. The Sony people, by the way, are all listening to this. Kissin says, what? <laughs> what do I have to do? He says, what? I said, you must never give another concert unless you include an original piece. This is what Kissin did. He threw his head against the wall and turned as white as the wall. I can't! That's how he screamed. He didn't say, I can't. Just, I can't! You can just tell that he was toying with this, 
but he just couldn't do it. I said, what do you mean you can't? You have to do it. You have to be another list. Look what list did. I can't. And I, I said, I walked away from him. The Sony people said, what did you say to him that you disturbed him so much? Do you know the end of the story? I think so, but why don't you tell it? He's composing and he's being published <laughs> and he's including his pieces in his program. I didn't realize that you were the one who inspired him to, uh, to, come, may, to come out as a composer. But I may not have. I'm only telling you this story. And it's it, going to be the same with this YouTube video. Because and it's the same with the, with Ethan exactly. Because you uh, you just gave uh, a tremendous amount of advice to every kind of pianist on the face of the earth, and who knows, some of them might go on to be great musicians who are performing at Carnegie Hall one day, and it was all because of Seymour, yeah, or yeah, or was, perhaps and, not. And there you go, perhaps not. I have a piano here. I should I. Should I practice it now? I think you've inspired me enough. Um, I, I'm going to play a, a, a scale, four octaves, at 144 BPM, fortissimo. Don't you dare. No. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Seymour. Well, I'll let you get back to your piano, and I'm going to get back to mine. And uh, I hope all the viewers at home have taken a lot away from this this video.